I'd had 16 years of unbridled, unqualified love and nurturing. I came from a very fortunate place. And at 16, I lost that. I lost this incredible security blanket and the richness of everything that is in that relationship. Unqualified love, unconditional love that was desperately important to me for that period. And I haven't got time, nor, nor do I wish, to necessarily bore you with the progression to, to now. You know, five decades in the 20, 20th century, when this generation made many mistakes and have, have left all sorts of untold uh, consequences for future, for future generations. But during that period, a, a couple of things happened. And I wanted to, to share a picture to show. This is my best friend. This is my grandson, William. He, he's only eight. And his arrival taught me more than most of the scholarship I'd been involved with in universities. Because the relationship I have with William is one that is truly and utterly based on understanding and love, and not as with my children, who I remain very close, where the relationship was based on judgment. And it taught me in, in later work, and the work I do now with international institutions, that if we could move from relationships that were based on judgment and on, on love that's based on conditionality, that we'd be in a better place. My son asked me recently um, what I was doing for my New Year's resolution in 2017. And again, it's a combination of a long conversation with my children about what I did and why I did it. And I didn't have the answer. I didn't want to give up smoking. Well, I don't smoke, and I don't drink to excess, fortunately, anymore. So I, I didn't have many things I could really be proud to give up. But I gave up anger. All right? And I went back to him the following week, and I said, look, Chris, it's a good question. This is my mission. Because in the years of work moving to where I've now had the privilege to be, this has been so true. So I gave up anger in 2017. And I used to be a really passionate, but I still am, those of you who know me. But I don't get angry. I get frustrated. I get hugely disappointed. I go beavering away and lobby and advocate and, and argue. But I don't get angry. And I'm much better for that. The me is better. And the people that work with me tell me that that makes a huge difference. Not easy, and I'm not perfect by any means. So I went from um, working as an academic to working as a diplomat. I spent many years in the Middle East and in uh, difficult postings for my family, but meaningful postings for me. Um, and I came to the, the place we are now, and the, the theme of this particular forum, to trying to assess what what lessons there are we could draw from the insights and the experience that I've, I've had the privilege of, of having that can look at how we can inject more harmony at the level of nation states and at the level of international organizations. I work a lot at the moment, as some of you know, with uh, a whole myriad of international organizations who come together in one dialogue about dialogue. So in the Baku processes, it's called a world forum on intercultural dialogue where, where remarkably over the last 10 years we've brought nearly every agency of the United Nations and many others to work together and to talk together in a non-hierarchical, non-ownership, non-confrontational way. It's been remarkably uh, difficult to achieve, I have to say, but nonetheless you can see the value of that. And one of the things that we've used as a device and I've used in my life to try and move forward in difficult contexts like such as that. Reflects, I think, strongly into where we seem to be with our polarized uh, societies that we've referred to already. And largely to those who seem to prefer to look back to some nostalgic place where they believe it was much better. And I did a bit of work in a tiny little bit of work, but, but lots of people did tiny little bits of work and it led to 
the Good Friday Agreement in, in the north of Ireland. In the island of Ireland, traumatic period, 300 years of strife that 21 years ago or so came to terms with itself to a degree. And uh, in the work I did there, I was looking at community tensions and because I spend most of my evenings at leisure, of course, as we should, downtime. This is a pub in Belfast on the waterfront that I fell upon one night. And it's another one of the formative things, the experiences that have changed the way I think about things. Some bright spark in, in the north of Ireland, in the Bel city of Belfast, as this wonderful bit of graffiti. It's not really graffiti, it's now institutionalized. And how sensible is that? that never can we move forward without respecting where we've come from. Never can we make progress without cherishing and respecting the dignity of the past. But were we to put two eyes on the back, were we to look only backwards, then that's total madness. And you can see this throughout. And much of our conversation about generations has been about that. Um, I'm not a great believer in holding out huge optimism for the next generation to sort everything out. In fact, I, I think that the demarcation between generations is unhelpful. So young people bring energy, they bring a lack of fear, they bring hope, they bring creativity, they try things. But I think the best generation to back our prospects is the now generation, and that includes all generations working together not one leaving it for the other, not the old generation stepping back for the new. So the now generation is, is what I do, and it reflects this message written on a pub in Belfast. So my final comment, um, the form formative years were finding what other inner strengths you could have once your mother's love had taken away. It sounds hugely powerful and personal. It was. It's a difficult thing at 16. I was very close to my mother. But somehow we've, we found other forms, other relationships, other ways of working. I'm very pleased to have had huge numbers of mentors and coaches, people that matter to me. So you're left with what can we do in a world where most of the conflict is not between nation states. Most of the discourse is at the level of global challenges. We're very, very bad at dealing beyond our immediate locality, and yet it's the immediate locality which provides the greatest space for us to be effective, step by step. So these are big contradictions that we grapple with, whether it's in my work with leadership or my research in, in peace and peacefulness. So I leave you with one call to arms, because I believe that we need to always be urging and striving. We cannot settle on a vision when everything's moving so much, but we can commit ourselves to visioning, to, to being active in taking stock of what's around us. So my, my final picture is a wonderful cartoon drawn at a, a peace conference we hold in, Co in, in Coventry that actually calls us to arms to say we have governments, we have international organizations, we have mayors, we have leaders. We have to take responsibility for holding them to account, not just deriding them for being hopeless or being corrupt or being ineffective. We must hold them to account. And what we do with the international organizations that come together and work, put them in the same direction, is to try and create harmony in the flow of their interrelationships, which must be one of the agendas that this forum can push on. When we go home, when we stand up and tell people what happened in Reykjavik in May 2019, as we must, the message will be about how we can get convergence. Whoever's got influence, whoever's got the ability to have impact and make a change, however small, must be mobilized together. Thank Beautiful. You. Thank you so much. Before we move to the next panelist, can you all join me saying thank you for sharing your story?
Thank you. It's an afternoon session, just to make sure that everybody's awake also. <laughs> Catherine, please. Sorry. Yeah. I think a lot of people here are thinking in terms of the forks that their roads have taken. So I have a couple of stories, a uh, bit cryptic, that basically reflect a couple of the turns in my own path uh, and some things I drew from it. I speak, I'm, I'm feeling very much now an elder, which is a role I'm not quite used to, but. Um, one book that I recommend to many people is a wonderful book called um, Composing a Life by Mary Catherine Bateson, who's Margaret Mead's daughter. Uh, but I think that that's really the way our lives are these days. Uh, I heard her speak recently, and she spoke about the fact that we've been given an extra 20 years of life that stretches our lives in our generations. And it means that the way we live our lives will be much, much less linear and much more in the nature of a composition. So a couple of moments from my own life. Um, my father moved to Nigeria when I was young, went to school um, in England, uh, but I was in Nigeria, in Ibadan, uh, during a terrible cholera epidemic, and thousands of people died. Uh, at the time, I was convinced I was going to be a doctor. My hero was Albert Schweitzer, I had written him a letter offering to come to Lamborghini, um, which I found, I confess, when my father died in one of his books. He'd never mailed the letter. Uh, but in any event, I was going to be a doctor. Uh, but everyone in, who was able-bodied was asked to help during this uh, epidemic. Uh, and it was, it was a frightening experience for, I think, a 14 or 15-year-old because there were very, very sick people uh, strewn all over the grounds of a mission hospital. And we were expected to change IVs and to clean up and to give people comfort. But at one point, a doctor came up to us, and he said two things that stood out for me. The first was, don't worry, even if you get cholera, it's easy to cure. This is a disease that affects people who are very poor and who are weak. The second thing he said is, look who's here. Who's here? It's mostly the men, mostly middle-aged men who were there. The old people, the children and the women were dying in the houses. So the message that he was taking, giving was that this is a systemic disease. This is a problem of systems. And in a sense, one faces the choice of do you minister as, a, as an individual, as a doctor, uh, even as a teacher, uh, or do you have the stamina, I think stamina may be <laughs> the most important word, to work in some of these global institutions. So that's my first story. My second story, I was a country director uh, in the World Bank for the Sahel region. Uh, and at that time, as it is now, the Sahel is one of the poorest regions of the world. Uh, and the critical issue, we all know this, what's important, what's most important, education first, education second, education third. Uh, and at that point, Niger uh, had at a maximum 20, 22 percent of children in any kind of schooling. Uh, and the tragedy from our point of view was that there was $200 million sitting ready uh, to act on, on that, but there was a strike and there were political problems, et cetera. But for me, we visited um, a school which had 120 children sitting on the ground with one teacher trying to do something with those children, and they were the lucky ones because they were part of the 20, 22 percent that had any kind of access to education. But the story then is that I went back to my family and my home, and the next week was visiting possible preschools for my son. Uh, there the argument was, was 16 too many in a class? Uh, should there be computers? Uh, there was color, there was light. And I was left with what for me is a burning passion that really drives everything that I do, which is how can there be justice? in the difference between what those children 
were confronted with in Niger and what my own child, but the children around me, were facing in the United States. And this sense, this inequality, and how we deal with this enormous inequality of opportunity uh, that we are seeing in the world today. That, so that's my second story. But I'm going to, can I have Mike Hamilton? Yeah, please. Um, yeah. Well. Just a very quick one, which in a sense is a little part of where I am now in this particular fork of the road, my 20-year fork of dealing with the bridges between religious and non-religious organizations. I was again, this time as a country director, in a, in a desert country, which I will not name, uh, where they were very unhappy to have a woman coming to basically talk about human rights issues uh, and social justice issues. Uh, but I was with the Minister of Agriculture. We were going to visit uh, a river valley uh, where there was every conceivable problem. There was torture, there was land expropriation, discrimination against women, refugees on both sides of the river, all sorts of problems. And this Minister of Agriculture was not happy to be forced into this situation, but they were looking for money. so. They, so we, we were driving, I was looking for topics of conversation, and I hit on camels. And I think he knew every camel in the country by name, but he knew everything. We had a fascinating discussion about camels and the milk and the hooves and the skins and, and everything, and I moved on to cattle. He was not so interested in cattle, um, but he had, knew something about it, then sheep and goats, yeah. Chickens, and at this point we were arriving um, in the valley, which was racially and culturally a very different part of the country. And I looked around me, and as is often the case in villages, there were children on donkeys, there was thatch roof on donkeys, water on donkeys, everything you can imagine on donkeys. So I said to him, well, what about donkeys? So he said, we don't have any donkeys. So I said, well, what? what are these things that I'm seeing? He said, ça n'a pas d'importance, not important. Uh, and what I came away from that story with was the enormous differences in what people see, even when it's in front of their eyes, and what, how they don't take in. They only take in what's within their frame of reference. Mm. And in dealing in what I do now, which is this bridge between a secular world and the many religious and spiritual worlds and trying to find ways to bring them together towards the common goal. This question of what people don't see mm. and helping them to see things they don't want to see uh, is one of the critical challenges. Thank you for sharing your story. Sienna <laughs> Figueres, please. Hello, everyone. Hello. I would like to start. I'm not going to start uh, 62 years ago when I was born. I'm also not going to start when my mother passed on because she has not passed on yet. I would like to thank. Uh, start by thanking Sister Chayanti because. Um, I'm going to share with you a couple of experiences of the process toward building uh, the eventual Paris Agreement, but I would like you to know that almost in every moment of falling into total desperation, there would be this little knock on the door, and it would be the sister. And she would say, hello, Christiana, I'm here to meditate with you. And I thought, what angel walks into my office <laughs> at the moments in which I totally need um, some peace and love? So thank you for bringing peace and love. Um, I want to start the story when I was given the responsibility to um, pick up a disastrous United Nations process. So any of you who follow climate change may remember that in 2000 and Nine, uh, we had a um, high expectation conference in Copenhagen, known by many of us as Hopenhagen, because there was so much hope. 
uh, and it ended up in a total disaster. Uh, and uh, I don't know if there are any survivors of Copenhagen here, but uh, there, were, there were quite a few thousand and six months later, I was given the responsibility of picking up this process where it was in the garbage can. And uh, Secretary General of the United Nations said, uh, could you please pick up that process and see what you can do with it? I said, okay, that's an interesting terms of reference for a job. I'll, I'll, see, what, uh, I'll see what I can do. Um, and what was really fascinating to me is that although I had been in that process for 20 years or 25 years before that, it had never really hit me what a deep hole of desperation and anger and distrust and frankly hate the world had fallen into about climate change because there, the prevailing sentiment was it is totally unfair, it is very unjust, it is what is destroying our society and we're not, we don't have anything to do about it. We, there's nothing that we can do because it's too complex, it's too, uh, too many differing opinions about it, too many interests, too expensive and the most optimistic people said it's too late anyway so don't even try. I thought okay well that's an interesting sentiment in which to work. Uh, the good news about that is that since everybody that was working on that didn't want to talk to each other because they were, you know, totally furious with each other, I thought, okay, good, there is an absence of doing here, so let's start to be, which is where we should start anyway, right? Before we jun jump into the doing of whatever we are doing, let's just take a few minutes and see what we are being. Who are we? What is it? What, how are we stepping up to the world? How are we stepping up to the challenge? And what are we bringing to it? Um, and my quick analysis of that was, uh-oh, we're actually in the space here of impossibility. And I thought that is what needs to be changed. So shorthand that I use now for that process is stubborn optimism in the sense of I really understood that we had to change the global sentiment and the prevailing feeling, the prevailing mindset, the prevailing thought force had to be, we are going to do this. We have no idea how, but we have to be optimistic in the sense, not of celebrating something that we had done because we hadn't done anything. So optimism is for me is not a celebration. It is a choice. It is a choice of mindset. It is an input to a challenge. It's not the result. And furthermore, when you have so many challenges in front of you, you have to be, frankly, very stubborn about being optimistic because everybody will tell you that it's impossible. And you will come up against many, many different, um, many different barriers. So you have to be stubborn about being optimistic. And that change in mindset began to pervade everyone who was working on this to the point where we moved from a global really bad mood on climate to say, well, we used to think it was impossible, now we think it's maybe possible, and then we went from possible to probable, and then we went from probable to likely, and then from likely to unstoppable. Uh, but it was the mindset, the approach. Who are we? Who are we as human beings? And do we want to look at ourselves in the mirror and accept that while knowing everything that we knew, that we had not done everything that we should? And that change in attitude is uh, one of the very transformational forces that allowed the Paris Agreement to occur. Of course, there were many other things that other people would see, technology, politics, et cetera, et cetera, but underneath all of that, a different way of being in the world. Three years into this process, when we already had a line of sight that um, maybe this is beginning to be probable and likely, uh, we hit a very, very difficult barrier 
And I was, I was sitting there going, what on earth is going on? Yes, I understood, I understood the politics and the, you know, the legal consequences, but I knew there was something underneath that was much, much deeper. And at the same time, because the universe is so wise, at the same time, my marriage came to a screeching halt, 25 years of marriage, uh, and I perceived myself as a totally helpless and hopeless victim of what had occurred. And for a year, I got up in the morning and I put on my optimistic smile and I went to work and I infused optimism into everybody and then I went home and I cried myself to sleep every single night. And after about a year of this and me not being able to get out of my victim role and the negotiations not being able to move forward, I thought this is, this is not good. This is not good. Uh, I'm getting to the point of suicidal thoughts about my own personal life, and the system is running out of time. We have to get, we have to move beyond this. And it hit me, we were faced with the victim-perpetrator dynamic, both in my personal life as well as in the international negotiations. Because the countries of the South were accusing the countries of the North of having caused everything, and the countries of the South are victims, and the countries of the North were saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Maybe we caused it in the, in the, in the past, but you are the perpetrators of the future. And so that victim-perpetrator dynamic was the same one that I was having and that I had not breathed to anyone, not a whisper to anyone, and nobody knew, but I could see that the, the victim-perpetrator dynamic that I had put myself into and that I had agreed to immobilize myself with was the same dynamic that was immobilizing the international negotiations. At which point I said, that's it. I cannot continue to put myself in that hole because the consequences are much graver than just me. The consequences are at the global level. And it wasn't easy, and I'm frankly still there, still trying to crawl myself out of, the, out of that. But once I had realized the relationship between the individual and the global impact, and once I had realized that the reality that I hold inside of me and that you all hold inside of yourselves individually, collectively has a consequence, and that we communicate that internal reality in ways that are somewhat inexplicable but also very understandable, then you really begin to understand the individual responsibility that we all stand in front of if we want to bring harmony at the global level. Because that means looking inside of us and moving ourselves into that space before we can expect anything else to change. Um, and the story continues, uh, and we did get a, uh, a Paris Agreement. And it is an incredibly, um, it's a multifaceted story because I realize it doesn't have an abrupt end, either for the international conversation or for me personally, but it has elucidated a very clear path. And it has brought many people to, um, to stand in front of our own experience and assume that, uh, and I loved what the previous panel said, that response ability. Because it is not just a responsibility, it is our ability to respond to the challenge that we are facing at that time. Thanks. Thank you for sharing your story. <laughs> okay, that was a good introduction to my story. Um, I was going to do it in Icelandic, but I understand there's no word for harmony in Icelandic, so I can't, so I'll do it in English. Um, <laughs> And 
whilst you thank Sister Janti and Sister Maureen for help, I have to blame them. They told me I have to come here. Um, they forced me uh, because I'm on a path and they're trying to help me. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I just want to explain. So, so whereas everybody else seems to be accomplished and they know what the answer to their path is, I'm asking for help. Um, so I'm going to show you a slide. I actually had three slides, but I don't think I can manage moving the slides. What, I don't know. Ah, oh, look at that. Right, so wait a minute, I'm going to move it to the last slide, which seems to be very complicated, and it is, which will divert you for a bit. Okay, so this is my story. Um, I was born in Cardiff to a not very uh, wealthy, well, poor family, Jewish, um, and went to school with an older brother and a younger brother, um, and I was dyslexic, dyspraxic, and slightly autistic, and was naughty and daydreamed and everything, and I got expelled when I was 15, and thought I was crap, and uh, worked on a street market in gutters in Pontypridd, Maesteg, and Abergavenny, feeling that I was awful. Um, uh, and uh, all the way through my life, somebody has come and saved me, and an uncle of mine, my mother's brother, came to me one uh, family affair and said, look, Andrew, stop doing this yourself. Because you're dyslexic, you can't think in a logical, linear, and linguistic way, but you have a holistic brain, and that's fantastic for retail, and standing in a gutter selling fabrics in Ponty Market is not what you should do for your life. Go and join a proper retailer and learn how to do something. So, um, what, what I was doing on the markets, I was at my limbic system, my reptilian brain, I was scared. I was thinking now and next week, me and my family, and that was it. And if I could do that, then I was successful. And in fact, I wasn't even strong enough to be aggressive. The way in which I found I could do that was to be friendly to everybody. So I was friendly to my staff and my suppliers and everything, and I was just being nice. You know, I, Because I was autistic, I learned how to be nice without actually being nice. Um, <laughs> So, so then I joined Marks and Spencers, and in those days, Marks and Spencers was, uh, only took graduates, and they, they, was a, they were a really sort of high-flying uh, retail company. And it was very odd to have somebody who'd been retailing since they were 15. And the chairman of Marks and Spencers, Sir Marcus Seif, saw me misbehaving at some meeting, and they said, look, you know, I'm sorry, he's a bit disruptive. Um, he's really good at retail, but we can't handle him. And he said, no, send him down to my office. Don't sack him, and I'll talk to him. So I went into his office and he said, I don't know what we're going to do with you, uh, Mr. Stone, but um, they tell me that um, I keep sending rules down to you and you break them. And I thought, here again, I'm going to be expelled. And I was upset because I really liked the company. And I said, look, I don't know what to do, but um, I think I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to run a company where you love the customer, love the staff, love the supplier, love the shareholder, love the community, love the environment. But you don't know what I do. I'm the merchandiser of hosiery. And if you stand down a, a, a law which is stupid, am I supposed to obey it? Then you make me into executive. Or can I say this is stupid? Let's do it this way. So he said, oh, so I'm Sir Marcus Eve. I'm the chairman of Marks Spencer's, And I'm stupid. You're the merchandiser of hosiery. You don't know how to behave. And I was really upset. And I went to stand up and said, no, I don't know how to bloody. And I, was, I, was, yeah, I swore. And, I was gonna, and he said, sit down and shut up. I'm going to make you my personal assistant and teach you how to behave. <laughs> so he then liked me because I became like the court jester. And blah, blah. Anyway, what, what happened, which was ridiculous, was then if in a meeting, if he wanted to disrupt something, he would say, Andrew, what do you think? And I'd say, I don't know. And he'd say, you see, he doesn't understand. It's too complicated. We're not going to do it. So then the people would come and say, Andrew, we've been working for this for three months. and you do So I said, well, I don't know what you're trying to do. So they said, well, we'll come two weeks before and tell you. So then I was the go-to person. And I said, no, don't do it like that. He won't like that glass. So then in the meeting, I'd say, and so all of a sudden, I became this. Well, anyway, to cut a long story short, he then started to want me to flourish, and um, he gave me a billion pounds of the menswear to look after. He sent me to three weeks to live with his tailor in Italy, Angelo Vutucci, who made his clothes and made the clothes for the, clothes for the Pope to learn what good menswear was all about. Anyway, so eventually, to cut long story short, he said, he actually quoted a rabbi who said, if you're not for yourself, then who will be? But if you're only for yourself, what am I? And if not now, when? And so he said, what your great 
thing is, is that you love the customer, you love the staff, you love the supplier, you love all these people, and if you keep them all happy and we're totally inclusive, then we'll be a great company. So now I'm using my prefrontal cortex, I'm thinking about the firm and the nation, I'm thinking next year, next decade, strategy and plan. I'm in the back of the Mercedes thinking, I'm a genius. You know, this is it, fantastic. This is it. I've got three kids and it's, you know, but, and then, I realized that I was running faster and faster because I thought somebody's going to find out who I really am. I'm not a genius. Uh, I'm Andrew, you know, and I was expelled from school. And so I had what's called imposter syndrome, and I was, I was driving myself mad. Anyway, so I used to go to a doctor who gave me something to talk if I was going to talk in the evening to give me some energy. And I went to this doctor, and he wasn't there. There was a locum, a woman, she's unbelievable, Claire Thormard. And she said, uh, I've got to do this test. Don't, don't do any tests. Give me the template. So she said, no, I can't do that. I, I said, look, I haven't got time for this. I'll, I'll do without it. So, and I had said a few things, then I went home. And I, well, I made my speech and I got home. When I got home at 11 o'clock, she phoned and said, look, I've been looking at my notes, I'm really scared. You are going to kill yourself. Not because you're depressed, but you're going to walk under a bus because there's something inside you that knows you can't go on with this. So I've spoken to your secretary, and in a month's time, we found a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and there's a Franciscan monastery in Scotland or a Tibetan Buddhist retreat in Ireland, and they can take you. So I said, what, you've spoken to my secretary? Yeah. So I said, well, I'm Jewish. I'm not going from Franciscan monastery, but I'll go to the Tibetan Buddhist one because in the 60s, I was meditating with a bit of hash. Anyway... <laughs> So I went to this place, and they said, right, we're going to wake you at 6.30. We're going to give you four hours of meditation to practice, and the rest of the day is yours. So I went there, and within three days, I realized <laughs> what you all realize, and that I'm trying to sell knickers and drive myself mad. So now I'm at higher consciousness, and I'm thinking that the whole object of everything is all people all beings for all time. And that when I meditate, that's how I feel, and it made me even better at running this 36,000 people company with 14 million customers, and that was it. So, because then I became the managing director, Tony Blair then wanted to change the House of Lords, and he wanted to put people in the House of Lords that were political and legal and whatever, and he said, oh, and I want to show the business can also be um, sort of socialistic. So he said, well, get me David Sainsbury from Sainsbury, and he picked me from and put me in the House of Lords. Now, I'm coming to the end. Then uh, I, I'm in the House of Lords, and therefore the chief rabbi asked me to help a company that was uh, working with the UN on rights and humanity. And I said, um, I don't know what human rights are. I'm not educated. I don't even know what they mean. So uh, I met with this woman, and um, I said, look, what are the seven principles of human rights? Just teach me like that. She said, that's amazing. Nobody's ever asked me that question. I don't even know. <laughs> So I said, well, we should know. If you know it, you can market it. So we then decided to have a meeting 20 years ago with the representative of the Dalai Lama, the chief rabbi, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and all sorts of other religious people in the House of Lords. They can't refuse it because it's on my posh-headed paper, come to the House of Lords for a meeting. So we had this meeting, and halfway through, they were all talking about God this, God that. And I said, wait a minute, it's not only God, it has to be something that's not God as well. I know the chief rabbi is not going to like this, but I don't believe in it. it's God. Anyway... And I said, I think it's bum, 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 bum. Then, after the meeting, this woman floated up to me, dressed in white, and said, where did you get that idea from? So I said, I don't know, I just sort of thought about it when we were talking. So she said, well, that's what we believe. And I said, who are you? And she said, we're the Brahma Kumaris. <laughs> and I said, who are they? And she told me about Mount Abu and Rajasthan and everything. And I said, I'm trying to meditate more because I'm not meditating well enough. Can I come? She said, yes, of course you can come. You can come and stay. So I spoke to my secretary. I've met this woman, Sister Janti. She told me, Brahma Kumaras, Mount Abu. I want to go there for 10 days. Um, so about two hours later, she said, my secretary, Carol, how long did, were you with this woman for? So I said, about seven or eight minutes. So she said, do you realize you have to fly for 14 hours to Mumbai, wait for two <laughs> hours, get a two-hour flight to Ahmedabad, then get a taxi for four and a half hours, and they've got a place in Oxford. <laughs> anyway, to cut long story short, they to taught me how to... I I've been with them 20 years, and they've taught me how to meditate at four o'clock in the morning and to be at that place B. But here's my question to all of you. I know how to be at B, but then, because of four o'clock in the morning, I'm, there's nobody there, and I am at one with the universe, I'm not thinking, I'm not feeling, I'm not emotional, I, you know, but I wake up and I start doing this, which is acting. And I don't know how to be at B while still achieving the thing at A. 
and I, I really don't know what I'm doing. In fact, what I'm going to do, I'm going to take a year off now. I'm going to try and buy myself a house somewhere two hours, three hours, four hours from London uh, as a sort of monastery for myself. And I want to go in to find out what is the authentic me so that I could be in front of you authentically. Now, what I'm scared of is if I was in, in front of you authentically, then you would see all the stuff that I'm hiding from you because all I'm showing you is what I want to show you. And <laughs> what I would really believe is that if we all had the courage to be able to be at B while being at A, we'd save the planet, but I don't know how to do it. Thank you for sharing your story. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, how lovely to hear your stories and what an honor to be on this panel and what an honor to be here. It's been a really fantastic two days. Uh, so, the question was uh, a story from our, our formative years, our spiritual upbringing basically. Um, which stunned me a bit because I hadn't very spiritual upbringing, but I would say there's two things that were very um, present in my upbringing, about who I was. I was very, very curious. I loved spending time with adults, asking lots and lots of questions uh, until they got fed up. Then I moved on to the next generation. Uh, my grandparents, and I asked them lots and lots of questions. And obviously they were retired, they had lots of more time. So that was, that was uh, very good. And they'd also reflected more upon life. Uh, so I find they had lots more, more interesting things to, to talk about. Um, and the other thing was I was very, very play playful. I uh, hated rules. I um, loved to do things my own way. Uh, I loved singing. I loved uh, theater. Uh, I loved doing um, funny things. And I think when I have those, playfulness and, and curiosity, then I'm really me. Um, I'll skip a few decades forward until I was 26. Until I was 26, uh, I think I lived a quite protected life. Um, I had a very big family, very uh, close ties with my, with my extended family, um, with my aunts and uncles and grandparents and cousins, and we celebrated all the Christmases and Easters and, and um, summers together, and I thought we have a recipe for success. No one in my family had gotten, gotten divorced. I, well, my aunt got divorced but not in my lifetime. And then she married Kofi Annan, so that was, that was fine. <laughs> um, um, but at 26, my parents got divorced. And that was a big stroke for me, because I thought that was, that was the life I was, was gonna have. That was the relationship I was gonna have, that was the type of career I was gonna have, that was the type of social network I was gonna have, that was the type of house I was gonna have, that was how I was gonna decorate my house. Um, and a year later, things got even worse, because then my, my ex-boyfriend uh, committed suicide. And obviously my, my family, they were, they were uh, not strong enough to support me, because they had their things to deal with, uh, with, with, with the divorce. So I, um, I went to a shrink uh, for a year and a half, and I, thought, I spoke probably a month about my uh, ex-boyfriend, and then I spoke a year and a half about my parents. Um, and she, she kept asking questions, and I said, well, this is the way it is. Uh, and all these thoughts that I got from my, from, my, from my upbringing, and conventions and ideas. And, um, and she said, but, but why? And I didn't have a good answer. So I had to come up with my, with my own answers, my own story, my own values. And uh, I think I really see that as the second sort of starting point of my life. Um, and it changed my life totally. I, I had a very conventional career. I was a lawyer as the, at the biggest law firm in the world. Uh, and I realized, no, I have to do something meaningful with my life. So I... So I um, I, um, I worked with my values, I wrote my first mission, which was to help people make a difference. Um, and I realized a lawyer is not the, 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 or not, at least not that law firm, was not the place to do that. Um, so I um, uh, started and I built up something called the Roll Wallenberg Academy for Young Leaders. 
and it was named after my grandmother's brother, Roel Wallenberg, who saved tens of thousands of Jews during the Second World War. Um, and then he gave his own life um, as, a, as, in a Russian, uh, as a Russian prisoner. Uh, so we had spent decades in my family trying to find out what happened to him uh, and trying to get, her, get him home. But at the turn of the century, my grandmother said that, okay, now we have to look forward. We can't just um, find, look at the past. Uh, as you said in your picture, we also have to look forward. How can Roel, Roel's legacy be an inspiration for the future? And we started the academy uh, to see how can we get more Roel Wallenbergs? How can we uh, help more people to make a difference in the world? Uh, and from a spiritual insight, I think that was so powerful because I had struggled as a lawyer. I had worked hard. I had tried. And I had not really succeeded. I mean, I was, I was doing okay, but not brilliantly. But as soon as I was in tune with my uh, purpose, with my values, uh, and also in this case with my, with my heritage and healing this family wound in a way, things just happened. We went from having 50 students a year in our program to 10,000 students in, um, in uh, a few years. Uh, and the interesting thing was, I mean, I did work hard for sure, but, but the things that had the most impact was not the things I did. It was uh, uh, the government deciding that we should have a national Roll Wallenberg Day. No one wanted to take care of it, so we said, okay, we'll do it. And all of a sudden, we had a national arena to work on. Um, and then it was a Swedish institute who said, okay, we're going to celebrate the, the 250th anniversary of the freedom of speech in Sweden. It's the oldest uh, country that has a freedom of speech law. Um, why don't we do that by, by exporting your school program uh, abroad? And all of a sudden we had uh, programs in, in 10 countries apart from Sweden. Uh, so it wasn't really things that I, I did. I mean, I, I went along with it. But it was just sort of going with the, with the flow. Um, and I saw the best thing I can do is sort of just taking a step back from, from, from the energy that wants to be released. So we introduced something called self self-managing. Um, I don't know if you heard about reinventing organizations, but it's about self-managing organizations. Um, so it was really, it was three principles, self-managing, evolutionary purpose, and wholeness. So that you can show up at your work with your whole person. You can be their intellectual self, of course, uh, but also your emotional being, and your spiritual being, and whatever being you have. Uh, and it just unleashed so much energy, so much uh, creativity uh, and responsibility. Uh, so it was, it was amazing. Then after, after a few years, I, I thought I, I've done my part at the academy. Uh, so I went traveling with my, with my husband, um, then boyfriend. And we went to, to Kenya. Um, and we met with some gay activists in Kenya. Uh, in Kenya, it's 14 years prison for any gay-related activity. And so we thought, you know, what, what can I do? I'm a lawyer, I've done human rights, maybe I can help. And they said, no, 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 this is our cause. If you come from Europe, it will backlash. And then we came, we traveled down Africa. I came down to South Africa and read uh, Mandela's biography and says, sometimes you don't choose your causes, your causes chooses you. And then we were taking the boat to my uh, husband's home country, St. Helena. And on the, on the boat, we hear that it's five-day journey, you know, one of the most isolated places in the world. Um, and on the boat, we hear that, that three days after, after our um, arrival in, in St. Helena, um, there was going to be a vote on same-sex marriage. So we thought, OK, <laughs> this is a cause that shows us. So we were campaigning, and we were doing petitions, and we were in radio and in the newspapers, and it was voted down. Um, so then we thought, okay, then this is our course. We'll have to fight it. Um, so we applied to get married, and obviously it was uh, objected, and we were in court for a year, uh, and then we won, and we got married. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, and then back in reality, back in Sweden, um, Trump has just gotten elected in the US. Uh, and I had heard about a party in Denmark called the Alternative Party. 
And what they had did was that they invited the whole population uh, to come to, to co-create politics. They had six values. Um, they had a, a manifesto, but it didn't have a political platform. They launched without that. They said, we were going to co-create this together. Um, and they invited everyone, even if you were not a member or if you're a member of the party, to, to uh, come up with your ideas for the country. And what I saw then was that they had done what we had done in the academy. Um, they had done, but they had done it on a national scale. They had done self-organizing on a national scale. Uh, so I thought, wow, you know, what if we can unleash everybody's creativity, everybody's uh, vision, everybody's engagement uh, to take responsibility for the country? So we started the, the, the initiative in Sweden, and what a journey uh, to start a political party. It's probably the most complex thing I've ever done. Uh, and uh, it's been ups and downs and a very bumpy road. Um, and I think my, my, my big takeaway from it is that uh, as long as we were in tune, uh, as long as we were in sync, as long as we were sort of riding the waves of the, of the energy that was coming, things were going fine. Uh, and as soon as we got sort of um, uh, trigger happy, uh, we wanted more control and we wanted more strategy, um, uh, things got very complicated, they got more conflicts. Um, so in the end, actually, I, I left the political party because I didn't know if I was part of the solution or part of the problem anymore. Um, but, but the journey has been uh, enormously, enormously um, um, formative, uh, transforming, uh, and I think we've really sown a, sown a seed for, for the future of politics. And I think there were three challenges that we wanted to, to, to tackle. And one was democracy. How can we build a new political culture uh, where, we, where we listen to understand? I haven't seen that lately in politics. Um, where we put ourselves in someone else's shoes uh, and where we try to build on, on, on others' ideas and try to co-create together. Um, the, other, the other two uh, I think it's, it's the vision. The vision was thriving people on a thriving planet. So we wanted to change, challenge, challenge, tackle the environmental problems we have and, uh, and uh, health problems, uh, not least mental health problems. Um, so I can tell you much more about that, but that's a brief introduction about who I am and my formative years. Very good. Thank you for sharing your story. Very good. Um, thanks again. I'm deep gratitude for sharing your personal stories with all of us. Let's take a minute of silence, just to you know, in showing up gratitude and also to appreciate an appreciation of these deep stories. Thank you. Wow. I'm just looking at the time. You know, we only have 30 minutes left, but at the same time, there's a lot of wisdom here. I mean, it will be, I definitely want to hear a little bit more from each of you. And um, so there are a few questions for each of you I'm going to ask, and then I definitely hope to open it for the audience to ask some questions as well. So may I start with Mike Hardy? You know, uh, Mike, you know, you had a lot of experience um, in many countries, uh, you know, during, especially during your career with, um, as a diplomat. And many of the, some of the countries were in conflicts, um, very difficult situations to work with. And could you share examples where international organizations collaborate with each other, and, or at least work in you know, some way of, some version of harmony? You know, what I'm really looking for here is some example of quote unquote, ray of hope or like some positive deviance, especially in difficult situations, some sort of inspiration for the group. So it's not easy. I mean, it's, uh, I was uh, quite a young economist when I first went overseas. I went to work in, uh, in the Soviet Union just after the, the, the major changes there. 
But I saw, what I saw was, uh, and I was a, an economics advisor in the Ministry of Economy, looking at the transformations required in business education, moving from congratulative planning to market economics. I saw um, a whole set of agencies, of non-governmental organizations, of good intent organizations, as mm -hmm. I call them, that emerged and sort of arrived. Nobody speaking to each other. Nobody seeking common ground or seeking agreement one with another. And uh, I moved quickly from there after a year to work in Cairo in Egypt, a very different assignment, completely different, in a different culture where difference really was huge and significant. Mm -hmm. um, and there again, there were all these visitors, these agencies, these arrivals, these coming to help and coming to sort out. Um, so there were very few rays of hope in the early days. But what, what's happened since then, I think, is that the old consensus of the post-war years, because of the amazing people, we've got some on the panel here, that were resilient and pushed and worked within the international agencies to make them improve, make them open. Um, slowly but surely, there's been more conversation, I think, and much more joined up. Mm. So that the current Secretary General, Guterres, I think is a star. I think he is trying to change um, a defunct and, and bankrupt organization into a relevant and one that will try and have impact. And his first message, as you all know, was that international agencies must work together, must be joined up. If mm. they are dysfunctional, the work that they seek to achieve will not function and will, will not be successful. So I think the, the great advantage now as an academic is, is that you can sit outside, mm. you can cajole, you can, you can write learned papers, you can provide evidence, you can provoke with, with real scholarship mm. and, and make people, you know, my slide about asking people to be more accountable, more res responsible was serious, but you mm. have to have an agenda that's based on evidence. So I'm an optimist in the sense that I think there is at the moment a, a movement driven by the Secretary General mm -hmm. to revitalize, to make the United Nations family more relevant, more significant, but by goodness, there's some change needs to happen. Wonderful, thank you so much. Now, if I, you know, one line or the sound bite is, the hope is in people. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. And on a similar note, for, uh, my question is to Catherine Marshall, where especially I'm looking at your work at World Faith Development Dialogue. The reason why I'm looking at that you know, among different hats you wear of the Faith Development Dialogue is an organization founded within the World Bank. And you know, World Bank at least had a huge role in actually its founding. So could you talk a little bit more about um, the perspectives of the role of faith traditions um, in addressing some of the big challenges in our world? And again, if you could lift up you know, some examples of um, faith traditions or like, you know, faith-based institutions or at the least faith-inspired institutions working with secular organizations? I referred to forks in the road, but a big fork in my road was when Jim Wolfenson, the president of the World Bank, and George Carey, the Archbishop of Canterbury, drafted me to work on the world of religion. And I was really sort of like my minister of agriculture with the donkeys. I was really, this was not my world at all. I was driven by the missions of poverty and inequality and therefore have spent really what is now 20 years in a voyage of discovery. But mm -hmm. among the things that, that I, I think are worth highlighting here is the remarkable religious illiteracy and the divide between, um, I, I actually, dislike it intensely when people talk about people of faith and people, the others, the sort of sheep and goats, mm -hmm. because I think the world is a much more complicated place and that you don't have these two sort of categories of, of people uh, and institutions. But there has been a conscious stripping of education systems, of understanding, basic understanding, of what is the Pew um, Forum has done surveys that 84% of the world's people have some religious affiliation. And you have institutions, the United Nations, the multilaterals, bilateral agencies, a lot of business, 
uh, a lot of um, other organizations have been able to ignore almost completely this world of religion and to view it in a very negative light. And post 9-11, in many ways, it's been worse. But in many parts of the world, this is the major infrastructure. Plus, survey after survey shows that if people are asked, who do you trust most, it tends to be religious communities and religious leaders. So the mission really is to try to build bridges and mm. to talk about religious literacy, but also to talk about secular literacy among mm. religious groups. And it is an enormously complex world of which you have a slice here, a slice that I came here to understand better because it's a piece of this. But you know, we know that, that religion is part of the problem and it's part of the solution. Uh, and I think our earliest surprise was the vehement opposition of almost every government to a dialogue between religious and development institutions. And clearly a piece of that is the assumption that religious institutions are essentially political, that they're, that they're about power, that this is not, as someone said, it's not warm and fuzzy. This is um, hard politics in many cases, or at least the perception. Uh, the other issue, there, there are some other issues around human rights, which are very fundamental, and probably none more so than the patriarchal structures of so many religious institutions. Mm -hmm. It's very refreshing to see women here in leadership roles, but that's very rare. Uh, and this basic um, unease in coming to terms with the modernization of women's roles is one of the major um, drawbacks, something that we have to deal with. So there's a lot of bridges to build and a lot of uh, dialogue uh, that's needed in order to bring what are the two worlds that care most about justice and about people and about the kinds of issues we're concerned about here into closer harmony, because at the moment they're not even close to harmony, they're operating in different, different spheres. Thank you so much for lifting up the opportunities as well as some of the challenges in working with faith-based institutions. Thank you. My next question, um, it's on a similar thread to uh, Christiana Figueres is, you, know, you did mention during your sharing of your story about the deep tr distrust and despair. And if you look at it, you know, there would be, there's a strong case to be, um, we, I'm hearing very well that, um, well, there is a Paris climate deal, but there is a lot of, you know, that that's done, but there is also a lot of, you know, conversation about undoing, you know, some elements of that. So do you think, if the benefits of talking about environmental care as a spiritual response, not just as a technical fix. So do you think the, the undoing wouldn't have happened, or like at least this conversation wouldn't be going where we are right now, if it was framed more as a spiritual response than what we had? Very good question. First, let me say, I, I don't think we have any undoing. I think we have um, deliberate blindness. Okay. Uh, chosen by some to be blind, but I, I don't see any undoing, frankly, because um, although we have the chosen blindness by some leaders, uh, when you look at the real economy, there is no undoing. There's actually a push forward, um, which is necessary. My concern is not that we're pushing forward. My concern is that we're pushing forward at a pace and scale Speed. that is not sufficient, yeah. which is very different than, um, than undoing. Um, but would it, would it help the pace and scale, I think is the other way to think about it, um, if we were more aware of who we truly are, which is my interpretation of, uh, of spirituality? Uh, obviously, yes, because I think that um, one of the things that we're still um, bifurcating our brain around is it, we tend to think that biodiversity in the natural world is a good thing. Mm. Uh, and, and, and we're pained to see the biodiversity that we are losing. But then we turn around and we look at the human diversity and we don't see that parallel. 
we don't, uh, we, we, we sometimes think, well, I think there are two myths around the human diversity that we totally have to puncture. The first myth is um, that we're all different and that's a bad thing. No, the actual fact is we are all different and that's a fantastic thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you see that in nature, the more biodiversity, the more diversity there, there is of flora and fauna in any ecosystem, the more resilient that ecosystem is, the richer it is. Uh, and so the diversity is exactly what gives the strength to the system and the longevity to the system. And that is true in the natural world, it is true in the um, in the human world, and and we have to we have to wake up to see that. The other myth that we uh, that we have to puncture is that we're all different and not we don't have anything in common, which is just as short-sighted as the first. Um, and yes, we are all different. How fantastic is that, right? And that is true of people. That is true of communities. That is true of organizations. It is certainly true of cultures and countries. Uh, yes, each country is unique and different. How fantastic is that? And we can understand that, appreciate it, honor that diversity at any level of the system, because whatever is true at one level of the system is true at all levels of the system. So we can honor the differences that we all have at all levels of the system, and at the same time, while honoring the differences and celebrating them, realize that there is a huge commonality uh, and that we as humans are all imbued with the human spirit, uh, which is what makes us such beings of such power because yeah. we are able to channel um, and of such vision and of such intention. It is the intention that gives the directional movement to the realization of where we are. Um, and I actually feel that, yes, um, <laughs> I tried to be respectful of the White House. I now call it the dark house um, <laughs> because there's just no lights on. Um, and eventually they'll turn the lights back on. But. But, but the, the dark house right now really represents for me the, the sad intentional choice to be blind about science, about solidarity, about love toward others, about, in fact, even about economic growth. Um, and so I don't call that undoing. Mm. I call that a choice that is made. Mm. Uh, I call that a moment that is being, um, that is being experienced by all of us, but it is not what has the power of moving toward the better, not what has the seed of, uh, of improving well-being. And I fundamentally believe that it is the power of good in each individual, and certainly the shared power of good, which is at the bottom of civilization, and of the world, it is not the other. Um, and so, you know, good luck to those who have turned off the lights. Um, they will turn them on um, eventually. Uh, and in the meantime, all the rest of us need to continue to look into that light and to move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much. There's a deep connection between the state of human consciousness and state of the world. So we definitely need that response to, if not for undoing, but to accelerate the response we, we need to make. Andrew Lord Storm, the question for you, it's related. During our conversation, you did mention that, be it climate change or many other issues we are grappling with. It is, unless the case becomes clear for harmony and care, more care, and um, also, uh, because I don't know how I came to my conclusions and I never trust them, when I hear somebody who has a different conclusion, I want to understand where they came from and therefore I understand their narrative. Um, and um, 
as I say, I'm, I'm 76 years old, but I was Jewish um, uh, when I was in that confused state on the markets in at the beginning of M&S. Um, there was a war in Israel in 1967, I was 25, and I must say this, that because I was disaffected, because I didn't feel I belonged anywhere, I thought, I'll go. I'll go to the war. And I'll tell you, if I had have arrived in Israel and then I said, you look like a strong young man, you're 25 years old, you know, do you know how to use a gun? No. We'll go on that mountain. Anybody coming over there is going to be a Jordanian. Even if they look like a pregnant woman with the children, shoot them. I would have because I didn't know what I was doing. So therefore, these people who are doing these things that we don't understand, then how can they do that? That's how it happens. Now, thank God, they didn't do that. When I arrived there, they said, look, everybody else is on the front line. We need to pick the cotton and do this, that, the other. And I started to work on a kibbutz. And in fact, the kibbutzniks were the ones that helped me to understand you know, what I should do uh, further in life. But um, so because I was there, that was 50 odd years ago, um, I then wanted to try and make peace. And um, uh, what was amazing, when I then uh, started to work with uh, Mark Spencer, I was Marcus's personal assistant, he then said, Andrew, you won't understand this, but it looks as if the president of Egypt, President Sadat, might visit Israel, and we're buying 99% of everything we buy from the UK because we want the UK to flourish, but we're buying 1% from Israel because we're trying to help Israel. I want you to start going and buy stuff from Egypt so that he can see that if he makes peace, you know, we'll start doing business together. So he said, in fact, this is so important, Andrew, that I'm prepared to risk your life on it. <laughs> anyway, so then I started to go into Egypt and we started to buy potatoes, groundnuts, lettuce and whatever. And so that visited Israel. And I thought, I did that because I'm egotistical. Anyway, but there was peace. So when I became managing director of Mark Spencer's, I started to buy from Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, Israel, Jordan, um, even Gaza, as you know. Um, and um, I... Uh, and therefore, people in all those countries know me to be somebody who believes there should be a state of Israel, but on the other hand, would only want it if it could stay, live you know, with our partners. And therefore, I'm able to cross lines and talk to people. And therefore, there's a number of things I don't want to really talk about here, but there's a lot of, you know, I, what I, what I, if you go back to my chart, within me, there's B and there's A. And compassionate people like Sister Janti and other people are saying, Andrew, stop doing this. What you think is that B is Christ, the Buddha, Moses, or whatever, and A is you, which is this market man. You are both. You just have to find a harmony between the two. Those are the chakras between it. And in the same way, whenever you meet anybody on the other side, we are both. And you have to find out how you can work together uh, in harmony. And... Um, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving the very practical example and also lifting up the role of business. The role of business in, business in actually sort of bringing in harmony and in peacemaking, yeah. Michael, when, I, when, I, when we had a previous conversation, one of the things I really you know, was interested and exci got excited about your work was you know, how do you actually bring together the left ideologies and the right ideologies, which is, you know, it's, there's a perception that it's kind of you know, at odds against each other. So, and you know, could you just give an example of you know, how do you actually bring in ideologies from both sides and what are the implications, if you could just talk about how it works in say business or environment or I mean, any other areas where how, how both ideologies comes together. And you know, do you play, you know, do you see the role of, you know, bringing us a harmonious relation? Is it a dialogue? I mean, could you give us some examples if you can, if you may? Yes, great. Um, so when we started the initiative, um, it was really a response to what we see in, in society where we see that the enlightenment or the modern society probably reaches peak in the 60s or 70s. And then we have the postmodern society, which sort of been the decline of that. Uh, and the ongoing decline, and we saw, okay, what's coming after? What's coming after the, the, the modern society or the postmodern society? And in the modern society, in enlightenment, we have, of course, right and left, and that's been very practical because it's very much been about how can we get more economic growth, how can we increase the pie, and how can we divide that pie? Uh, and obviously, uh, that has been a need that we had, uh, and that need is to a large extent met. Uh, and that's why it, it's becoming harder and harder to, to put things in, 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 in right and left. Um, 
I'm not saying that all needs are met, but I'm saying that there are other more pressing issues mm -hmm. now. Um, and, 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 and right and left is in fact also our, our own personal needs. Uh, I mean, the right, you talk very much about the need for freedom, the need of autonomy, um, and, and, and the liberty. And, and on the left, you talk about the need for, for belonging, community, compassion. Uh, and obviously, we need both. We can't have one without the other. Um, so when we started, we, we said, okay, we're going to have, we're value-driven parties. We have six values. We have two uh, values that, that emphasize the, the need for, for autonomy, and that is courage and the spirit of action. Then we have two values that, that uh, uh, emphasize the, the need of, of uh, belonging, and that is um, compassion and uh, co-creation. And then we have two values that, that um, emphasize the need of, of development, and that is optimism uh, and openness. So that's our six values. And on a very practical level, how do we do this? Um, I mean, take, take an issue like uh, um, feminism, for instance. Uh, on the right, uh, people say that you know, as long as, as uh, we women uh, stick our necks out and we work hard, you know, we can do it. You know, and that's that's true. Uh, and on the left, you say, well, there is st structural discrimination. There is a patriarchal system. Uh, we have to break that system, and that's also true. Uh, and obviously, it depends on the context. If you sit in parliament and you make laws, yes, you have, you have to take the structure into account. If you are an individual person, then you have to see, okay, what can I do as an individual? Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's, that's one example. If you look at the environment, um, it's, then we lean a lot against uh, science, science. What does science say? What does science say we have to do? What does the planetary boundary say we have to do? And how can we do, go within that? So that, I think, is the, is the thing we lean, up, uh, lean against. Um, yeah, I think that's the, 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 the answer to, the, to the question. Very good. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, there is a lot of... <laughs> there's a lot of depth here. There's a lot, of, lot more stories to share, but I'm mindful of the time. So, and we don't have much time with, from the quest, for conversation with the questions from the audience, but I don't want to miss that. So what I'm trying to do here is get the questions from the audience and our all the panelists I uh, agreed that you know they'll be around for during the coffee break and you know, let the question come in that the sponsors could actually happen during the break and you could actually connect with the panelists if you could stay back a little bit during the coffee break is that okay sure. okay so let's um, take the questions and uh, when you say um, share your name um, your organization or your where you belong and keep the questions brief please my name is Vala Ragnarsdóttir from the University of Iceland. I have a, a question uh, particularly for Mark. You said that sometime in your career you, you were uh, responsible for changing business schools into the market economy. Since the market economy based on neoliberal thinking is actually at the basis of, of destroying our natural world and the outcome of that is climate change, don't you think it's time to change the business school again? Yeah. Good question. <laughs> sorry, we don't have time for a response, so maybe, you know, take the, there were, I, could, I saw a hand here, okay. Okay, so I'm probably speaking before I'm ready, but um, this question is bubbling up. Um, it's an invitation to you and to myself um, to attempt to look through this question in a non-duality, non-binary frame. Um, I jumped ship about seven years ago from international organizations, NGOs, and discovered local-to-local, um, -local endogenous, bioculturally engaged engagement on climate change, and it was interfaith and indigenous and spiritual. And what has blossomed up from that is a model of networks that are reflective of the way ecosystems work, and humans as part of ecosystems, part of nature, and it, there's an elegant solution to a lot of the complexities and problems that we find within our existing dominant institutions. My question to you, um, as we look at the richness, the awakening, um, the 
the heart and engagement of all of these people who work in international institutions and national governments um, and with a history of institutional path dependency that impacts vision and lens of what is possible is the life cycle within these institutions such that there will be an end to a scientism and Durkheimian um, top-down structure that will be begin to transform, transcend, and morph into what we're seeing in this model that is more reflective of our Earth ecologies? Um, or is this something where we will see a collapse and new systems, new models, come up and bring everyone along with them? Easy question. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Emily. Um, I'll take four more questions, try to keep the questions brave. Yes. Hello. Yeah. Uh, my name is Karen, and I would like to direct my question towards Christenia. I wanted to ask you, uh, for us, the young people, what advice do you have for us? Because we are the ones that will be working for the global institutions in the time being and for the time to come. What do you advise to us to do? Thank you. I can see a hand up there at the back. Okay, ask the mic get there. Shall you take the question from the middle? My name is Yasune Moneo. I am from Spain. And I used to write about climate change. And coming back to the first speech uh, of here, the lady, I don't remember your name, about climate change, about the victim attitude and about the hope. I'm going to talk now in the name of two kids of my life, one niece and one, another one uh, from the same family. First, we ask 11 years old, what is the definition of impossible? He was answering very easy. That impossible is whatever nobody tries. And then, about my niece, we were talking about um, cartoons, uh, something like sim sim kind of stupid. But I said to her, do you remember Marco, the guy that went to America with a small monkey to, to go for her mom? See, oh, but that's very sad the story. But why do you think he went to America? He said, she said, 10 years old. Two reasons. First one, she was loving her mom and he wanted the mom back. Second, he was believing he can reach America. So then for me, the big question here is, how can we encourage hope? Because when I talk with people, most people I know, they don't really have hope. If we imagine the minds of everyone, 7.7 .7 billion people in the world, how many of us are waking up in the morning believing in ourselves, in our possibility of success? And this is not just a question for you all. This is a question for we all. What can we do to encourage global hope? Thank you. The final two questions, when I can over the please. Hi there, thank you very much for a fantastic dialogue and discussion. I'm Torkel Falkenberg from Karolinska Institute in Sweden. We've had some turmoil at Karolinska Institute, so we have realigned our strategy and vision along with the 2030 SDGs, the UN goals. So suddenly we have come from a very conflicted uh, situation and now suddenly we are aligned with the vision for the future, which are the SDGs. Now I wonder, do you see any openings, any, th any ways to capitalize on the SDGs for bringing harmony out on a global level beyond north-south and beyond and also fostering gender equality and so forth? I didn't hear so much about the SDGs here. I see them very promising for what we're trying to achieve. So I would love to hear that at some instance. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the last question at the back there. 
Hi, my name is Elin and I'm from JZI oh. Iceland. Sustainable um, Development Goals, sorry. Yes. <laughs> so, my name is Elin and I'm from JZI Iceland. My question is, because you've spoken about values and uh, religious institutions and uh, you said that uh, people tend to follow the religious institutions more than other institutions. Um, so, do you think that we as people and global institution are following our core values? Do you know what they, do, do we know what they are? Um, and what have strong values have to do with harmony among nations and institutions and between ourselves? Thank you so much. Um, I know we could continue with more questions and dialogue, but again, at time we are out of time. So, as mentioned, um, if you have any specific questions, follow up with the panelists. You know, please come to the front, and then you know I hope you can continue for some time and also try to catch them during the coffee break. Um, thanks again. Um, can I have a f final round of applause for the great panel? And thank you all for joining. Thanks again.